So the astute observers out there may notice that I've got a few more shavings uh, on the table and the bench than I had in the previous video, at the end of the previous video. The reason being is I woke up early this morning and I guess I wasn't fully awake yet. I made a wonderful video. It had action, it had drama, it had everything you could imagine, but I had forgotten to turn on the microphone. So it was a silent video. The one after that, I forgot to hit the record button on the camera. So the moral of the story is don't try to uh, operate machinery and a camera at the same time too early in the morning. But here we're gonna switch back to our 3 8 inch, so two flute, double-ended end mill in the 3 8 inch end mill holder. And we just thread that guy on. With the new end mill holder, um, it may not even go on that smooth because these threads were pretty tight and they are meant to be tight, meant to have accurate tolerances. Just give that a quick snug up. Now we've cut all four of our long faces and all we have left to do are the ends before we get to some more um, interesting operations. So I've already clamped a piece here in the vise. I'm using the same parallels as, as we were using to do facing. The only difference is, is I have the parallels hanging out a little bit more on one side and the piece hanging out on the other side. This is so we, we don't cut into our parallels by accident and we don't cut into our vise by accident. So that's why we've got the piece extended out here a little bit. Okay, so I'm having a fun time with recording videos today. Uh, this is actually the third time I've attempted this one video. Uh, the first time I forgot to turn on the microphone. Uh, second time uh, the memory card filled up fairly quickly. And after I replaced the memory card, I forgot to hit record again. So this time, all of those are in order. So we're good to go. And we're going to be cutting with the side. So with the actual flutes, rather than before, we were mostly cutting with the face and just the very tip of the flute. One thing we have to pay attention here is what's referred to as the flute length, which is from where it starts cutting at the top straight down to the bottom. What is that distance and is it wide enough for us to cut our workpiece in one pass? Uh, in this case, it is wide enough. It's uh, either 5 eighths or 3 quarters, somewhere around in there. I didn't look exactly, but our workpiece is only a half inch. So we'll be able to take this cut in one pass. The other item that we need to start talking about now that we're doing this type of a cut and we've kind of been ignoring in some of the previous videos is what's considered a conventional versus a climb cut. So right now I'm going to be doing a conventional cut. I'm going to run this as slow as I can. I've locked my Z axis as well and I'm just going to hand hold my X axis. We could lock it if we wanted to. So in this feed direction on this side of the workpiece, I'm doing a conventional cut. Now if I were to come back, now I would be doing a climb cut. The climb cut is not as good at removing material or as efficient at removing material, but it can leave a better surface finish. So if you just do a very, very light climb cut at the end, you'll get a little bit of a better surface finish. Uh, you can probably also see that we're getting a different type of swarf here, um, or a different type of chip. As, as the long length of the cutter peels it off the workpiece. Now a little bit more on that climb versus conventional cut. Our cutter is always going to spin in this direction. This is the forward direction of the mill. By default, it's the only direction that the mill has. Now, when we're doing a cut in this orientation, we're going to be moving our piece front to back or back to front, so along our y-axis. I'm going to exaggerate this a little bit, but if we were to turn the machine on, we would be cutting into the back face of the piece going against the direct forces of the cutter. So the cutter is trying to push it forward and then it will exit out the side. But primarily the cutter is applying its forces in a forward direction when we're doing this cut 
we're applying our workpiece directly against the cutter, which is going to result in a conventional cut. And that's your best for stock removal and, and just general milling application, uh, milling operations. You're going to use that type of a cut versus a climb cut. Now in a climb cut, what's happening is that the cutter face that's going to come around here on the back side is going to try to come into the left side of the workpiece and then it's going to exit the front as we move the piece towards us, towards the front. So in this case, the cutter is pushing a lot of force to the right and then also pushing force front forward as we're also feeding forward. And this is really the difference between a, a climb and a conventional cut. Um, I'll do another video if, if people want to see it or, or want more details on it uh, with some diagrams and things like that to show what some of the other differences are that you get between those. But those are the basics. And during most operations, we are going to want to do a conventional cut. Those climb cuts we should reserve uh, just for finishing cuts for the most part. Yeah, we are taking a pretty light cut on this. I am also running very, very low RPMs, just so you can kind of see uh, a little bit more of the, the action maybe on the camera of the chips coming off. Now I did feed a little bit in the x-axis, so we're going to take a little bit of a heavier cut on the return. Otherwise, on the return, we would have maybe had a little bit from machine flex but we would have gotten shavings that are, uh, that are much, much thinner than hair. Uh, do be careful with these, these shavings that come off the side of the cutter. They can be uh, razor sharp, uh, particularly in steel. They're not quite as bad in aluminum, but they will still poke you pretty good. And that's really all there is to, to cutting with the side of the cutter. Um, we'll do some rabbiting operations and notching and uh, other things in other videos that uh, used combinations of these same principles we've already covered, but that's pretty much it. Now in the next video, which I, I will still uh, put up uh, since I have already recorded it, um, we're going to put a, a hole in our workpiece, do some layout operations, as well as then put a slot um, in our workpiece. Now the y-axis, as it comes from Sherline, the, the lock on the y-axis doesn't seem very stiff to me. Um, it doesn't seem to, to really hold well. I haven't tried cranking down hard on it, um, but it is a, a small thumb screw pressing against a nylon spacer into a slick piece of plastic, and it just doesn't give a whole lot of grip and, and grab as much as I'd want it to. So I'm going to take a break before finishing up this series on this project. Uh, I'm going to jump and I'm going to do uh, another video on a Y saddle lock or Y axis lock before coming up and finishing the rest of these pieces. Now at the end of the next video, this, this is nearly a functional piece. I mean, we can do some finishing work on it and we still need to tap a hole, but otherwise at the end of the next video, we should have pretty much a finished piece.